him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Karibu. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Yes, um, our senior pastor, uh, thank you. And uh, missions, uh, Harun, for this opportunity. And the entire KCC family. And those who are visiting with us from the U.S., from uh, Sitam, and everywhere else, Karibuni. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Um, before I begin, I have my wife and uh, children with me. My family is with me here today. I request them to stand up. Um, yes. Uh, that's my wife, uh, Joyce. We've been doing life together for the last uh, 17 years. I'm really grateful to God. Uh, Wesley, Mark, the firstborn son, is in Form 2, senior school. And uh, Kayla Amani, uh, she's in uh, Grade 8. Asante Nisan. Yeah, so... Um, I've uh, interacted with the KCC family since uh, 2003. That was my first interaction with the KCC as we went for a mission in Lamu, uh, outreach and uh, with the Wainainas and all that. And I thank God because um, I know a number of you know Medical Missions Africa. And uh, in that mission, uh, we were there with Dr. Jeff. I know you know a, a few of you know him. He's uh, our secretary in general and all that. And as we went around uh, doing the outreach and all that, we have been mulling and thinking about the idea of um, a medical missions agency. At that time we were medical students. And uh, as we went, uh, you know, around the villages and all that, uh, seeing the need and all that, you, you can imagine you're in a community with about 8,000 people at that time, and they are telling you there's only one non-Christian in that entire community. And uh, I thank God for that mission because uh, it was like a defining moment. It was really what we had been thinking and praying about was actually defined at that point. And by the time we left Lamu, our decision was made. This thing must be born. Praise the name of the Lord. So I'm eternally grateful for KCC. You helped me to define the vision. It was there, the burden was there to be able to make a difference uh, through medical missions. But that particular mission was actually like the defining moment that this is what we really want to do. And this is how we are going to do it. So thank you guys. You have been a blessing to my life. Uh, so uh, this morning, or oh, it's afternoon already, uh, I was requesting to share a little bit as we think about our missions month on how to be positioned for the promise. How do we get that renewed passion? and fire for what God wants to do. Because as we sang, as we said, the task is great. We've not even, you know, we've just scratched the service. There's still so much to do. There's still so many souls out there that we have to think about. And we have to not only think, we have to go beyond thinking, we have to go beyond intention, we have now to go to action so that we can actually be able to see the difference. And I want us to reflect briefly from the scriptures we've read uh, from the book of Joshua chapter 1. As we pick a few lessons about uh, what we really need to do as we go forward as the children of God. So I hope my... God. Oh, sorry. Unfortunately, the font is a little too small. So you may have to see it by faith. <laughs> if you are... <laughs> 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 uh, sorry, sorry for that. I didn't think about that. So um, there are a few things as we think about this scripture. You know the story, the children of Israel have been waiting for this particular moment for many years. Actually, uh, when you read uh, Genesis 12, Genesis 15, you're going to see many years, many generations of uh, 400 years before God had spoken to Abraham and told him, I'm going to give you this land as your inheritance. And I'm going to give it to your descendants so that they can possess uh, this particular land. So guys have been waiting. They've been in a state, you know, they're like, yeah, we're waiting uh, for this particular moment to come. And now, they are there, right at the brink of the promise. And God comes to Joshua and he speaks to him and uh, gives him a commission. He reminds him, why are you where you are right now. What is it 
this particular moment where you are, what is it that is happening, and what is the Lord saying? And as we think about how we can be positioned uh, for the promise of God in our lives, there are a few things I want us to reflect and think about. Because if we don't take time for self-reflection as believers and think about what the Lord is saying to us, and which direction is going to take us, we're going to just while away our time, pass through the years, yes, nice Christian going to heaven and all that, but we will not be able to make the impact that God wants to make in our generation. And so there are a number of things I want us to reflect about from this particular scripture, which will be helpful to us as we think about what God wants us to do as a church, as God's people, because there is work to be done. So, in this scripture, number one, I want us to realize that we must realize the call and embrace the commission of God for our lives. God comes to Joshua and he tells him, now my servant uh, Moses is dead. I don't think that's a good introduction, um, but uh, it is an awakening call for Joshua that there's something that you need to step up into. The old is gone. There's something new that I want to do now and you need to be able to embrace it. So we need to realize and embrace the call of God that he is giving us at this particular time. And there are several things that God challenges uh, Joshua and the people at that particular time. Number one, he gives them a call to awareness. So he tells him, now my servant Moses is dead. That is like a wake up. It's like, hey, do you realize something has changed? You need to step up and you need to do something about it. And as a church, we need to ask ourselves, do we realize that things have changed? Times have changed. Generations have changed. And what are we doing about it? Are we awake to that call? The second thing that uh, uh, the Lord does uh, to uh, Joshua, he tells him, now then, you and all these people, I want you to get ready. So it's a call to preparation. You see, we may be aware that there's something we need to do. But are we prepared for it? Have we prepared our hearts for it? Have we prepared our minds for it? And also, have we prepared our pockets for it? Because uh, we must put, you know, we say, we put where? Put your money where you are? Mouth is, isn't it? Put your treasure. Where is your treasure? That's where you're going to invest. So as we think about this, are we prepared? Are we preparing ourselves for it? Because the task that is ahead is not an easy task. And it needs a prepared people. Then he tells him, every place where you're going to set your foot, I am going to give it to you. He goes on ahead and even tells him, no one will be able to stand up against you. So these are called to pursuit, a call to warfare. He is telling him, okay, it's not enough that you say, yes, I'm ready. I know Gishagi is coming. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. It's good. I'm praying. Uh, are we ready to put our foot in now uh, so that we actually take personal responsibility? for what actually God wants uh, to be done. This is a challenge that God is giving and throwing uh, to each one of us today. Then he tells him, he calls him now to go in and possess, a call to possession. He tells him, this is where your territories are going to extend. He gives him all the dimensions to the east, to the west, to the north, to the south, and all that. So have we defined the territories and the dimensions of what change that we really want to bring? We think about Lamu, uh, we think about Gishagi, we think about uh, many other places that God is using us to serve. But we need to ask ourselves, is that all? Is there more that we need to do? Are there territories that we need to expand to as we hearken to what God is saying? And the other call that God gives this man is a call to fellowship and intimacy. So he tells him, I'm going to be with you. I will not leave you. Wherever you're going to go, all the days, I'm going to walk with you. These are called to fellowship and intimacy uh, so that we can be able to actually fulfill the mission that God has for us. So God calls us as his church to fulfill that great commission. And where he calls us, he promises a victory. Praise the Lord. Uh -huh. uh, that small graphic is uh, trying to show us uh, some uh, a little thing, a few things about what is happening in the world and stats around the world. What you can see in um, green 
and a bit of red among the nations, and a bit of brown, don't, uh, um, you know, men are column blight, so I don't know whether that's brown or something, something like that. That, <laughs> when you look at those nations, they, f they are around 65 of those nations. They form 60% of the 7 billion, 8 billion people in the world. But only 3% of the missionary workers we have in the world are actually working in those 65 nations. Majority of them are where you are seeing the purple or something like that, which is actually already reached and evangelized places. When you look to the graphic on the right, uh, unfortunately you may not be able to see it, it's a little bit about the nation of Kenya, which is basically a well-reached nation and where people have been able to go into many of the places. But we still have need. We still have few people in our neighborhood who actually need Jesus Christ. And that takes me to the second point of what we need to do today. We need to cultivate strength, courage, and boldness. If we are going to really carry out the commission that God has for us, we must cultivate strength. We must cultivate boldness and courage for the promise. Three times in one verse, the Lord tells Joshua, be strong and courageous. And when you see God telling you, be courageous, <laughs> When you, tell, when you see God telling you, be courageous, he knows you're going to meet things that are fearsome. You're going, you're going to meet things that can make you run. So he tells you, man, you're going to stand your ground and be strong and courageous about what I want you to do. And um, you see, engaging in missions and being able to go for the promise that God has for us requires strength and courage. We must be well rooted in the word of God because we're going to meet challenges of different nature. There's something that our senior pastor mentioned here, and I want to echo uh, some of those stats this morning. That in some studies, uh, some research which has been done uh, around uh, Pentecostal, evangelical Christians and all that, about 66% of believers do not know any method of how they would tell somebody about Jesus. How they would cut. This is a standard done among believers. People who are going to heaven, they are tongue speaking, and all those kind of things. And you know, can you imagine? Like seven out of ten don't know how I can start a relationship, for instance, and a conversation with somebody uh, to be able to share the love of God. I think those are things which need to make us wake up. Don't you think so? Um, and now, that is not even the sad part. The sad part is that 8 out of 10 non-believers, people who don't even go to church at all or anything, say that they don't mind their Christian friends sharing with them about their faith. Wow. Let that sink. On one side, we have 7 out of 10 of us who are wondering, how would I start a conversation with this man, this colleague, this neighbor, this relative of mine, this friend? Some of them are even friends. This business uh, uh, person that we do business with every other day. While on one side we are struggling to think, how do we strike a, uh, how do we strike a conversation? On the other hand, eight out of ten of them are saying, if somebody actually told me something about their faith, I wouldn't have a problem with it. Just like our pastor mentioned, you know, you met that guy, you, you just maybe you are parking, you are reversing somewhere, and the fellow is there directing you, and then you're like, hey man, how can I pray for you? You know, it's a simple thing that makes a big difference. And I've seen that work. I've seen that work with my patients. I've seen that work with fellow doctors. I've seen that work with all kinds of people, high and low in the society, and depending on whichever part of the spectrum you may find them. It works. And you don't have to go holding your Bible, you know, and tell them, you know, the Bible says. In fact, if you begin with the Bible says, most likely <laughs> uh, the conversation is over. It's before it has begun. Isn't it? But they are simple things. You know, we have to think about it. But we have to be bold. We have to develop the boldness and the courage that is required so that we can be able to initiate that conversation. That's more pep talk that you have with that person. When they are going even through a moment of difficulty, somebody is sick, they have a loss, 
me or something like that. And you're like, okay, I know you're going through a hard time. Can I pray for you? Just that. You have no idea how that is going uh, to make a big difference for that person. And that may be just the only pointer you needed to be accurate to be able to find a way into the heart of this man. Praise the name of the Lord. Uh, the third thing uh, that we must think about as we cultivate this is that um, we must commit ourselves to standing and the obedience of the word of God. So when God tells Joshua, this book of the law will not depart from you day and night. You're going to take time to stand it. You're going to take time to read and see what actually it says. Now, not only that, you're going to meditate on it. So you're going to take time to think through over and over what is actually the word of God saying to me. And not only that, you must be careful. You must to make sure that you do. You follow, you put into practice the very things that you are learning are from the word of God. You see, if we hear the word of God and we don't do nothing about it, it's like that man and James talks about. Look at yourself in the mirror as you're leaving the house and you see, yeah, my hair is nicely made. Yeah? For, especially for the ladies. You know, as men, we don't have much problem. But especially for the ladies. Yeah? Yeah? In the house, check yourself, you know, do your makeup and all that. But I assure you, when she comes, most likely she's going to pass by the washroom for two seconds to check again. Is still my hair in position, isn't it? And still maybe do a little more eh, before I step into the, into the church, isn't it? And it's just maybe even 10 minutes away just drove 10 minutes to the church or something, and yes, you, you still want to look at your face again after 10 minutes. That's what the Bible says when we don't do what the word of God is teaching us. We forget. You know, just the same way. If you take a bicycle and park it in your garage, it doesn't make it a car. Isn't it? Yeah. The same way, when we hear the word of God, and we do nothing about it, that word has no impact. It cannot transform us and it cannot change the people that we meet. The graphic that you are seeing a little bit, unfortunately, I said you are not able to view that very well, is actually saying, it's trying to say, among Christians, are those who try to make an attempt to be able to reach people and all that. Only about three out of ten will ever make an attempt, at least once, to share the love of God with someone. Think about that. Imagine the way we are here right now. Three out of ten. And I think that is a wake-up call to obedience. If you are going to occupy, if you are going to take the promise that God has given of the nations and to be able to exercise and bring the word of God to fruit, then we must wake up to the call for obedience to the word of God. And that takes me to the, second, uh, to the fourth point, which is that we must commit ourselves to obedient action. So God, when he commands Joshua to go forth, there's something that happened at that time. There were some guys from the tribe of Reuben, the Gadites, and the tribe of Manasseh, who already had received their promise across the Jordan before the others had crossed in. So for them, they're already in a place of comfort. I've already received what I've been waiting for, isn't it? That is what they have been waiting for all the years, and they've already received it. So is there any more hunch for a further drive? What would drive that man to go again and fight when I already have what I've actually been waiting for? What I've been pushing for? So why should I? But Moses, uh, uh, Joshua speaks to the people and he reminds them the promise. And there's something important that Joshua reminds these people. It is not about the fact that you guys have received what you are waiting for. It's about all of us. Praise God. It's about each one of us coming to the knowledge of the master. Coming to the knowledge of the savior. The fact that you are born again 
and you are doing well, you're coming to church, but we have a neighbor who is unchurched. We have a colleague who is unchurched. We have business colleagues who don't know Jesus. We have every, we meet them every single day. And that means the mission field is right where we are. Some of us think mission field is in Lamu. So we say, October, we're going to Lamu. And we pack our bags and we can go to Lamu. The mission fields are right on our doorsteps. Our neighbors, our colleagues, relatives, husbands, wives, sons, daughters, yeah, uncles, aunties, colleagues, and both as superior, as subordinate, whichever. We have mission fields right there with us because everybody needs to hear the gospel. The word of God says this word is going to go and you're going to take it to all the ends of the earth. Every nation, every people, every language, every color, every class, it doesn't matter. Every man needs the gospel. And so Joshua challenges the people and tells them, hey, it is not a time of comfort. The fact that you are born again should not give you comfort when there is a sinner who is still lost. When there is a neighbor who still does not know God. That person needs to hear and that person needs to receive the message of God's love that brings a change in their life. And so everybody unites to that purpose and they say we are going to cross with you, we are going to go with you until each one of us in the tribes of Israel receives their promise. So we must be willing to step out in faith and be involved so that then Lord can release the promise for his people. And then, as we continue, we must cultivate a culture of prayer, a culture of giving, and a culture of going. There are three things I say that every believer must do. Every believer must pray. Every believer must give. Every believer must go. We need to pray for the strength of God. We need to pray for the direction of God. We need to pray for the empowerment of God. Paul prays in uh, Ephesians 6, verse 18 and 19. He urges the church for prayer and says, pray for me so that I can be given utterance. The Lord can open the doors. I can be given the boldness I need. The Lord can protect us when we are out there in those mission fields. We can be able to carry out the message of the gospel. We pray and ask the Lord of harvest so, to send laborers in the vineyard. Matthew says in Matthew 9, uh, verse 36 uh, to 38, that when Jesus saw the multitudes, he was filled with compassion for them. For he saw that they were like sheep that are scattered without a shepherd. You know, that is exactly what is happening all over the world. Sheep scattered without a shepherd. And he tells the disciples, pray ye to the Lord of harvest that he may send laborers into his vineyard. That's a prayer that must be in the mouth of every believer every day. We pray for those nations, for open doors to those nations. The Bible says in Psalms 2 verse 8, ask of me and I will give you the nations as an inheritance, the ends of the other as a possession. Number two, we say every believer must give. You must make a deliberate commitment and deliberate discipline to support the work of missions with your giving. And I like what the Bible talks in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 to 7, about the story of the Macedonians. These guys, the Bible says, these guys were not rich people. It's not that they had surplus, actually. When you read, you see the Bible describes them as a people who are actually in need. But the Bible says, out of the heart of love and great generosity, they sacrificed themselves. They first gave themselves to God. And then they gave their resources so that they could be able to support the cause of the gospel. And so Paul challenges them and he tells the people, as you excel in all the other things, in your faith, in your ministries, and all that, in preaching, in your prayer, remember also to excel in the grace of giving. 
So let us excel. Let us make a deliberate commitment. If you want to occupy the promise, we must pray, we must give, and then we must go. Everybody must go. Some of us are going to go to right in our neighbor homes right there next door. To Gishagi, to uh, some of us are going to take a flight ac across the Atlantic to come for a mission. They are going. Praise the name of the Lord. So the mission field is ready and it is wide. And it calls for each one of us to wake up to eight because everybody needs to be involved. So what is it we are saying as we think about being positioned for the promise and as we think about the missions that are ahead of us and that we need to do on a day-to-day -day basis? This is a call to action for each one of us. The promise is given by God, but it must be taken by men. God gives a promise, but people have to take it. People have to possess it. People have to own it. People have to run with a vision. So I want you to think this morning at a personal level. How is God calling you to be involved? How is God calling you to be engaged? How will you be engaged to pray? How will you be engaged to give? How will you be engaged to go? Think about that. And as a church, we continue to ask ourselves also, how are we going to commit ourselves and the mission of the church to what God wants to do locally and globally so that we can actually receive the promise that he has made? And then in prayer, that we pray for the strength, the courage, and the unity that we need so that we can have a renewed passion for the promise. Remember, God gives the promise, but the promise must be taken by men. It will not come without your involvement. So what do I say today? It's my prayer that as you think about Joshua and the way they had waited for so long, and when the moment presented itself, they were ready to go for it. That as a people, as a church family, we are going to be ready individually and corporately to take on the promise of God. We are ready to go on our knees and tell God, renew the fire, renew the passion, renew the desire in my heart so that I can run with a vision and I can serve the purpose of God in my generation. Amen. I want to welcome our senior pastor uh, so that uh, he can lead us in a moment of prayer even as we pray for the mission team. Thank you. Let's appreciate our brother. Thank you. Everyone must. <laughs> wow, they, they, you have done well. They're ready to go. They say everyone must go. I hope it's not go home. No, no, no. Everyone must pray. Then everyone must give. And everyone must go. Go. Thank you for that reminder that indeed we have been called to a great calling. Reminds me of this hymn, Guide Me, O Great Jehovah. Truly is the one who can guide us into this area. So let's sing this hymn as we reflect on what we have heard and ask the Lord to lead us in these areas. Guide me, O the great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with your powerful love. Bread of heaven, bread.
Guide us to realize and embrace God's calling and commission. Help us to cultivate strength and courage and boldness because we are in a world that, Lord, is averse to this good news. It is combative when they hear this name of Jesus. But we have in us one who is greater than the one who is in the world. So, Lord, we pray that you will encourage us, bolden us as we go. Lord, we commit to study and to the obedience of your word. If there are areas we have not walked in obedience, we ask for your forgiveness. Here we are, O oh Lord. We desire to walk in this obedience. We commit ourselves to obedient action so that, Lord, as we develop a culture of prayer and giving and going, we are doing it because first and foremost, we are drawing ever closer to you. We are finding our joy in you. We are living for the audience of one. And so I pray, O oh God, as we continue to live in this world, you will encourage all of us, all of us, none to be left behind, to be a light into the world and to reach out and to share this good news. And for those in the midst of us who have not yet given their very lives to you, Lord, bring them to this place where they can acknowledge that Jesus is everything. Jesus, you're all that we need. You're all that this broken world needs. And apart from you, we are lost and we have no hope. So I pray that they will make that decision for their very lives. So God, we thank you for your message that has come. Thank you for your servant, Dr. Goodwin, who has shared this word with us. May we meditate on these words like you commanded Joshua every day of our lives. This good news that comes from you. We thank you, Lord, and commit all that we have heard to you because we know as we do so, you bring fruit from our lives. So we thank you for this is our prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen. Let me request all who will be serving in one way or the other in this medical camp to rise up wherever you are as we commend you to the Lord. Everyone who will be serving in this uh, missions, medical camp. Thank you. Thank you. For the rest of us, let's continue to pray for this team and others who are in the youth church. For this team, as you go forth to serve the needy community in Gishagi, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift you up and give you joy as you serve among the needy. As it is written in Joshua, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. May you find strength and courage in these words as you embark on this mission. May he grant you strength and endurance for the busy and the strenuous week ahead. May your hands bring healing. May your words bring comfort and your presence bring the love of Christ to those that you serve. And as you labor in love, may you be guided and be upheld by God's mighty hand. Go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, knowing that you are his hands and feet in this world and may his grace abound in you and may you return with hearts full of joy and testimonies of his faithfulness. Amen. Let me request all of us to rise as also we share the words of 
Before we share the words of grace, may the Lord bless you. May this word that you have heard bear fruit in your life. May you desire to know him that you may share him with all. As you think about this, ask the Lord to guide you this week to bring people your way that you can pray with and share this good news. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Our visitors, apart from those from SSBC, we have a Karibu Lounge down there. Pastor Charity will be at the stairs. You can greet her and get to know a little bit about her. Thank you so much. God bless you. And have a blessed week. Amen. Oh